President Buhari writes Senate for approval of $800 million loan request a few weeks to the end of his tenure. And the Center for Accountability calls for immediate stoppage and reinitiating of the recruitment process of the Office for the Auditor General of the Federation. This is Plus Politics, and I am Mary Ann O'Connor. President Muhammad Buhari had on Wednesday wrote to the Senate asking the Honorable House to approve a new loan request of $800 million. In a letter read by the President of the Senate, Senator Ahmed Lawan, President Buhari, who noted the loan would be utilized to scale up the National Social Safety Net program, well, he said that the loan would be sourced from the World Bank. Joining us to discuss this is Richard Inoyo. He is a principal consultant, product development and management of the Africa Industrialization Group, Incorporated. And also joining us is Jide Awobiide. He is a legal practitioner. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us and good evening. I think you're muted, Jide. Well, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Um, Great. Richard, thank you also for joining us. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Perfect. I'm going to start with you, Richard, because this is your 40. Um, one of the most intriguing uh, things is that as we speak, Nigeria has exceeded its borrowing limits this year. Apparently, um, we, before we even got into this year, we had already sought for about 11 trillion Naira loans adding to what Mr. President is asking for now. I'd like to read something. The Minister of Nas Finance and National Planning, Zainab Ahmed, had said that the federal government will borrow over 11 trillion naira, uh, and they will be selling national assets to finance the budget def uh, deficit for the year 2023. That means that we're losing as we're borrowing, not just losing in terms of the fact that we're not able to just service those loans. We're selling off our assets in order to be able to service these loans. How deep um, seated is this problem uh, that we have on our hands? Well, first, let me start by let me start by saying I'm not really surprised at the attempts by the federal government to borrow, and I'm not also surprised at the attempt of the federal government to practically sell national assets. Let's not forget that last year. Uh, the finance minister, Madam Zena, came out and then she made it clear that we have over 11 trillion deficit to finance our budget. And when she made that statement, she also told the Nigerian that for us to finance deficit, we have to rely on by borrowing and then also selling national assets. That was the budget that was passed. passed by the Senate. So what we're saying today is the implementation of what has been passed into law. So literally, the fact that Nigerians are surprised now, I find that very strange. But that itself goes to show that we have very serious problems in our hands. The fact that over the last six years, we've been asked And when we use the word limb in respect to the GDP, the fact remains that the Senate, based on requests from the President, can basically alter the Act. Okay? So the Fiscal Responsibility Act has been altered over the last three years. Mm. After 2021, the peg, the limit for borrowing, was around 25%. Today, what they're trying to do is to shift it to 40%. So it's not about what the Act says. It's about what the President and National Assembly are willing to do by altering the Act so as to ensure that they can increase borrowing, which is dangerous when it comes to not only our credibility to repay, but also it also shows fault lines in how we approach the issue of financing government expenses. Hmm. Um, still talking about how deep-seated this problem is, because you talked about how dangerous it is. 
Um, why do you why why are these requests cons constantly being um, you know granted? We've seen the presidency come um, with different subheadings to uh, request for these monies, and we've also seen the IMF and the World Bank on the on the one hand raising an alarm as to the incessant you know um, loan um, requests. But the bigger question is. Why are they still giving us monies if they have fears that we're, we may, in the long run, be unable to pay these monies? I think I didn't get the question. Please, kindly just... I'll ask again. I didn't get that question. Yeah, so my last question is, we're seeing the IMF and the World Bank raise alarm about these loans that we're unable to service and how, you know, we're continuing to borrow ourselves into so much debt. And I'm asking, why are they still giving us these monies if they're so concerned about our inability to pay back. Chair, the World Bank and uh, International Monetary Fund, they are institutions that I'm not a fan of because the truth is that they have been part and parcel of the problem we're facing. Because what they try to do is to ensure that first, they make available high interest, outside the fact that they have high interest loan. They also create a conditionality for the repayment of those loans. Part of those conditionalities will mean to increase energy tax tariffs, to increase tax. If they increase tax, the corporate tax, for instance, that really means we will be paying one of the highest in the world. Not only that they ask to increase tariffs, they also ask to increase tax. Then they also ask indirectly to increase the price of oil in the name of trying to remove oil subsidy. So IMF and World Bank, these are two institutions that if you really want the way they go about doing their business, they really don't care about Nigerian citizens. Even though in the way they try to pretend they are concerned about our rising debt as in portfolio, but at the same time they are always willing to give this country talk this debt that they know clearly that Leaders of this country do not have the best intention to use those debts to address our financial problems. And there are some of us who believe that we don't really need these debts because we have several ways to finance our budget, like equity financing. You can export equity finance, finance your budget. I'm a member of the Media class every time. As of two years ago, we wrote to the president and we told the president that Nigeria has over 97 trillion naira being held down by international oil corporations as well as NDAs in this country, money they refuse to remit to the federation account. 93, 97 trillion naira is enough to power our budget at least in the next two, three years. So we have enough money to do this. But unfortunately, we have a government that seems to have strange what I call romance with debt, and they are willing to borrow not the fact that not the fact that but the conditional okay, uh, Richard, just hold on. I think we're having a little connection issue with you, and we're unable to hear you. But let me come to Deji. Deji, uh, just just part of the question that I asked him: the National Assembly. Yes, a lot of people would say that the National Assembly is a rubber stamp legislature. Hence, it's, it's being in cahoots, allegedly, with the presidency and allowing all of these, um, you know, requests to be granted. Um, but the biggest question on every Nigerian's mind today is, why is Mr. President um, taking out such a huge loan weeks before his tenure ends? And what does this mean for the person who's taking over, being that this government has borrowed and over-borrowed, leaving Nigerians and generations to come indebted? Uh, thank you for the question, Marianne. Uh, it's very, it's very obvious. I mean, it doesn't need a soothsayer to tell you that uh, this is a government that is financially reckless, and it's a government that wants to, wants to continue to put the Nigerian people in abject poverty. Even though the uh, what the president said in his letter is that the loan is for the purposes of um, lifting poor Nigerians out of poverty by ensuring that the money is uh, paid to them. Uh, if you look through the contents of the letter, you will find that it's a whole load of uh, uh, hogwash because you, you will see that not, the, the, the Nigerians that they want to credit their account details, 
are unknown. We don't know who these people are. What is the data that is available to them to make, and enable them to identify who these Nigerians are? And you had eight years to do this. Why are you doing this two weeks to, uh, barely three weeks to the end of your tenure? Of course, so it's all uh, reeks of uh, corruption. I mean, that's what it looks like to me. And I believe that eventually, if we, if, if, if we look through the books, we will find that there's a grand scheme to continue to uh, deplete our collective resources. Because it absolutely has no, makes no economic sense. There's basically no reason economically, particularly given the fact that at the December of last year, our debt profile was uh, 46.25 trillion. Our debt profile was at the last year, December, was 46.25 trillion. And you're still going ahead to borrow this money, reach the end of uh, your tenure. Uh, now, if I may ask, uh, when this loan is approved, who's going to process this? Is it the incoming president that would not process these loans? Or what will happen to the loan eventually? So, in the grand scheme of things, we also need to point fingers at the membership of the Federal Executive Council. Yes, uh, it is comprised of his appointees, uh, ministers, uh, the vice president, the secretary, uh, secretary to the government of the Federation, uh, minister of state, but they are failed uh, collectively to tell the president some own truths. Uh, because if, if at that level, you are unable to talk to the president, to let the president realize that this particular action will not go down well with the people that we are leading, then uh, it all smells of hypocrisy. As a, as a minister, you should be able to disagree. You've had, in other, uh, in other uh, countries of the world, where ministers do not agree with the policy decision of the government, they resign. They let the public know why they disagree with the president or the, or, or the prime minister, and they give their reasons for resignation. But in our case, we have yes men, people who are willing to just say yes sir, yes sir, and they approve all kinds of things. I mean, in the past eight years, you see all manner of things approved. If you compare this, um, the past four, almost four years now, of the National Assembly led by Ahmed Lawan, and the four years prior with uh, Senator uh, Bukhara Saraki as any president, you will see the very, very contrasting positions. You know, you had a, 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 the, the prior Senate was able to engage with the presidency, disagree on issues, approve the ones that were needed, disagree and refuse to approve the ones that would uh, uh, plunge uh, Nigerians into poverty. But you have seen the difference in those four years with this current president, any president that we have. You have a Senate that cannot question uh, the president, that cannot summon him to come and ask, you know, answer questions as to why he's embarking on a, on a debt uh, accumulation spree, a, a, a impoverishing Nigerians of all, uh, both of all classes. And, you know, it just, it just tells you that these people or these people in government do not even understand that Nigerians are suffering. Do not even care about the suffering of the average man on the street. You want to just continue to pile up the debt and eventually you would find that if this new government comes in, they would find ways of ensuring that if the average Nigerian is the one who's still going to pay back these loans by some way or manner, you know, either through taxes, either through uh, increased tariff, uh, you saw the, the other, the other two weeks ago, there was, an in, there was a revised tariff scheme for alcohol and a few other things. So you find a way of pushing this burden back to the Nigerians. But again, you have the Auditor General, you have the Attorney Federation, you have government officers who should be accountable to the people, who should ask questions. Nobody's asking any question. This, you just go ahead and rubber stamp all of these things. And it's very, very disheartening. Who should be asking the questions? Because you see, um, we have members of the National Assembly, like you have rightly stated, who are in cahoots with the presidency. Why are we not asking the questions then? Why are we, the people, those who have an, an idea of what's going on, have we really been asking questions? Do we even care what's happening uh, at, you know, at the highest level of government? Or do we just you know, hope that a miracle will happen? Because you, we talk about this in passing, that people are not asking questions, but who are the people that should be asking the questions? And are they the people, asking the people questions? The people I refer to are not the average Nigerians. If you go to social media, you will see a lot of Nigerians complaining about this, this loan request. In fact, social media is uh, awash with a lot of uh, comments. People expressing their, their anger as to this continued borrowing. When I mean the people, I mean the people who have been elected to serve the House of Assembly, the, uh, the House of Rep members, the Senate 
uh, uh, senators representing their districts who are not asking the questions that should be asked. The ministers who are members of FEC, because if you see the letter, the president said, oh, FEC approved that they should proceed with this loan request. That FEC consists of all the ministers and all the ministers of states, as well as the vice president. So all of these people put together, they are not, uh, not the number of that FEC... But these uh, are appointees of Mr. President. What, what sort of questions are they going to be asking? These are men and women so who, are, so whether we like it or not, are, 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 are appointed the by the president. president. What about the people yeah. that we voted into power? And I'm talking about the members of the National Assembly. And, and you yes. talk about social media. The, the cries and the hue ends on social media. But what about asking for real accountability, not just on social media? Well, we need to activate the process of recalling some of these our members. Well, well, for this one, it's about nightfall now. So they are living in about, about three weeks. But for this incoming uh, National Assembly, we need to be more proactive. We need to exercise the right of recall. It's a constitutional provision that enables us to recall these members. We should recall a lot of them and activate the process so that if you are not, if you are in government, if you, if you are there and you are you are not able to uh, do what is right, you're not able to put the interests of your people first and foremost beyond your own interests. Then we should ask questions about recalling you, and we should try to get more people engaged in that process of recalling these members. So you win elections, fine. We, we voted for you, fine. But we should go a step further to recall those members who are not pulling their weights. You can't just go there and receive salaries for four years and allowances, and then come back after four years and you have built houses, you bought new cars, you have accounts in the US and in and, and the UK. We should stop that. We should now become more, 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 more focused to ensuring that we're able to recall some of these our members from the National Assembly. All right, let me come back to you, Richard, if you're still there. Let's talk about um, the cost of living crisis that we're facing in this country. Of course, a lot of countries are, ha have been faced with inflation, um, and they have come up with ideas and cushioning effects on how to deal with these issues. Um, every time we talk about borrowing in Nigeria and the debt profile, uh, we hear stuff like, oh, even America is owing. Um, but in Nigeria's case, what we borrow to fund is what's in question. Um, again, just as Deji said here, um, if we're all having to deal with um, the, the cost of living, the hike in prices of goods and services, the lack of pay rise and people unable to take their take-home pay, not being unable to take them home, um, how do we try to stall these kinds of requests to make sure that it doesn't go through until we're given good reason uh, and see where previous monies have been put to good use? Richard, can you hear me? Richard, are you there? Can you hear me? Oh, I don't think that we have Richard. Um, let me come back to you, Deji. I think I want to pose that same question to you, if you heard me. How do we pause the process of these monies being approved in the first instance? So ideally, in, in, in under normal circumstances, under the provision of the Constitution, the Constitution expects that the legislature will be a check on the executive. So even if you have a reckless um, executive, you, you should have a prudent legislature that should ask the questions. So you want this money. What do you need it for? The ones you borrowed, what have you done with it? What are the projects that you want it for? How does this project impact the lives of Nigerians? How does it help our economic growth? How does it advance our political interests? If we continue to borrow from the IMF and from the World Bank, and all of these agencies, how do we, how does, it, how does it help us as a people? Now, we have a, an unfortunate case whereby our legislators really know next to nothing. Even if they do know something, they are already in bed with the executive. All they want is their allowance and, their, and, and all, all, all the benefits that come to them by reason of their office. They do not understand the gravity of the position that they occupy, that they can ask the questions, the tough questions of the executive. So when, they real, when the deputy realizes that we are in bed with them, all they will do is keep on bringing frivolous requests and you keep granting them at the expense of the people. So what I'm saying, and it's very simple, is how do we stop this? This is the question you've asked me. The only way we can stop it is to have more citizen engagement of exercising the process of recall. If you start to recall people with the help of the judiciary, okay, that's the third arm of, that, 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 that's, that's the third arm 
we try to recall a lot of these guys back from the National Assembly, they will sit up. Then they will know that, oh, the people are weak. But if we don't recall them, and we assume that, well, they are already there, what do we do? Like you said, we shout on social media, and we protest, and we go on Twitter, and Facebook, and Instagram, and we lament, make videos, and all of that. Or even if we jack bar, as they currently do now, we are still faced with the problem. Even if we jack bar, you can't leave your family behind. You can't take your family with you. Some relatives will still be left in Nigeria to deal with this, this hardship. So what we are saying is being able to get advocacy groups to be able to enlighten the people on the power of recall. It's a provision in the constitution. We can exercise that. Saying that our people do not want to exercise their own powers of impeachment. You can impeach a reckless executive. You can impeach any executive government that is not doing what it should be doing. If you are there for four years or three years, you're not doing anything tangible, the legislature should, should be able to, to impeach. That's enough ground to impeach. But they don't impeach anymore, or they've stopped impeaching for reasons best known to them. But what is important to us as a people is that for the next phase of our democratic dispensation, for the, for the incoming government, our agenda should be, as those in the media, as, as legal practitioners, as those in the uh, civil society space, enlighten the people to activate the process of recall, recalling legislators who are doing next to nothing. We are not advancing our interests, we are not advancing uh, our cause, and we, we want to continue to remain in bed with the executive to plunge us into further penury. And that's, I think, is the way to go. I think we have Richard back. Richard, can you hear me? Richard, can you hear me? Are you there? Hello, Richard, can you hear me? I can hear you, I can hear you, I can hear you. Okay, great. Let's talk about the, I mean, I'm sure that every government has an economic plan, an economic strategy, and a team. And half the time, that team is chaired by the vice president of any administration, whether it be the Buhari or the Goodluck or the Abbasanjo administration. Looking at the economic plan from 2015 up until now, what's been achieved? Uh, and also bearing in mind all of these loans and the humongous budgets uh, and the deficits that come with them, how well can you rate the Buhari administration in terms of its actualization of an economic recovery plan, if there had been any whatsoever? And have they been able to do anything in, in that regard? To be honest with you, the Buhari government basically didn't recover anything. It didn't lead any recovery. It only created new problems. Now, make, let me quickly give you reference to the fact that as of 2014, we had a country where the economy was doing very well. Not only that, not only that we had the largest economy in Africa, we had the 26th in the world. As of then, Nigeria was not the property capital of the world. But as it is today, we have an economy that is the best in the world. So we've dropped by five positions. So countries that were doing better than before, they are doing better than us now. So when it comes to the policy of this government, it's clearly around borrowing, 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 and acquiring public debt. So there is no clear economic policy to drive the economy of this country to surplus. We've been in deficit for close to six years now. So the truth here is that we don't know what this government is doing. The only thing we know that this government is doing is in the area of just borrowing money and using the money wrongly. It's even insulting to get a government telling you that how they intend to finance deficits is by borrowing as national assets. Every intelligent and compassionate government is supposed to ask this question. What if there is a place we can borrow? What if there are no national assets to sell? What are we supposed to do to finance our budget? For us, I believe that this government is spending so much money on things that are not necessary. So first, the government is to cut down expenses, especially when it has to do with stability. That's one. Two, the government must also recognize the fact that 
MDAs and international oil corporations owing us over 97 trillion naira. That is sufficient for us to finance the next three budgets. But because of the laziness of the government, the government refused to go after its MDAs and IOCs, and the money, as I'm talking to you, is still resident in the accounts of those institutions. So as far as we're concerned, this government, not only that the government has shown total what I call disregard for sound economic policies, the government has gone ahead to apply toxic, destructive economic policies that we know clearly will only just be forcing more Nigerians into poverty, increasing the cost of energy, disrupting our industrial target, and creating problems we will not be able to solve in the next three years. So, anywhere you go to, if you want to look at it, you discover clearly that this government is injected in anything positive when it has to do with either financing the economy or restructuring the economy to perform better. Uh, let's talk about, um, quickly, the recent um, cash um, situation with the CBN. Um, many would say that uh, at some point the CBN governor um, somewhat um, took over the responsibilities of the finance minister, the agricultural minister, and there were so many things, um, lines that were being crossed uh, in a bid to, in his words, save the economy. And yet you're telling me that um, it looks like this government did not necessarily have a sense of direction in terms of uh, the, an economic recovery plan. What is the fate of the, or what is at stake for the next administration uh, after the May 29th swearing in? And um, what's to be inherited, other than the fact that we do have a huge debt profile? What is in store for the government that is to come? Well, the government that is coming is going to face very tough time. Because first, if you look at the credit ratings organizations in the world, they basically rated Nigerian credit worthiness very poorly. Why? Because, because we are borrowing without basically costing value for what we're borrowing. So what that simply means is that the next government coming might not be able to have access to cheap loans, but it's a good thing. Because it's allow the next government coming to think out of the box, engage its imagination, and create value by using our natural endowment. But on the overall, what this government did over the last seven years basically is going to create conditions where Nigerians will have to go through difficulties at least the next one, two years to be able to get back on track and to start investing in critical infrastructure like energy, like roof construction, like agricultural, and all of the factors we need to build stronger economic fundamentals. Hmm. Well, um, that's a very gloomy, gloomy note for a government to start on. But that's our time, gentlemen. I want to say thank you uh, to Richard um, Inoyo, uh, Deji Awobiide. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for being part of the conversation. We're hoping and keeping our fingers crossed that something good comes out of all of this. Thank you for having me. We can only hope for the best. <laughs> yes. Well, still to come, calls have been made to stop the recruitment process for the office of the Attorney G uh, Auditor General of the Federation. So stay with us. We'll be right back.